We have been looking at Job. This is week five. Can you guys believe that we're going to be finished with it next week? We were in Proverbs for for like I think a million years. Well, I, I missed a bunch of Tuesdays, so I'm kind of behind. Um, which, which they are all online. If you at any time you can watch them. How cool is on that? The, on Facebook. Yes. Because I don't have a Facebook account. That's a good thing. I think you can still watch them. You can still watch them. Yeah. Okay. I think you, yeah, I think you, because yeah, it's because of the public guys, page, right? Used to you can get on Facebook unless you have an account, but I think they changed. I it. found a, uh, I found you guys' YouTube, the YouTube channel, and I thought maybe they were. On well, there. technically, you found my old YouTube channel. <laughs> it says to the Russia Community Church. Oh, okay, so you didn't find the other one. Uh, I thought you meant mine. No, no. Okay. Yours. I want to say what's the because that mine is uh, th there's there's like three of them, and, and yeah. I'll okay. explain it later. Okay. Anyways, so we're 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 on week five of, uh, of Job. Um, and last week was the end of the dialogue between um, the three friends and Job. Now, okay, so so far, the, fir the first week we looked at um, just the, the, what was going on between God and Satan, really. I mean, Job was mentioned, but we really didn't see much of his character um, other than, you know, he was blameless. He's doing all these, th doing all these things, being, a, being a, a good person. All right. But most of that uh, focus was on what was happening uh, between God and Satan. Now, the interesting part in all of this is that Job is completely oblivious <laughs> to what is happening between God and Satan. This whole this whole conversation that they're having, he's completely oblivious. So as far as he's concerned, holy crap, a bunch of things just went bad. <laughs> and uh, so then we, we, in chapter 3, um, after his friends sit in silence for seven days, which was the greatest good they ever did to him, uh, they go on this. He, he, Job starts talking about how he just he's just miserable. He you know he curses the day of his birth, just like Jeremiah the prophet would later do. Um, and uh, and then his three friends are like, uh uh, you're not gonna start talking about your sorrows in my house, not in my house. So they start going through like trying to systematically prove to this guy that he's like the world's worst sinner. And he just needs to repent because he's just he's just a jerk. And uh, so Job keeps defending himself. Well, then that takes us all the way to chapter 31, which is where we ended last week. Now, all three of the friends give a speech once and three rounds. So Job talks, the three, uh, a friend talks, Job talks, a friend talks. They get through all the friends three times. So there's a total of nine discourses from the friends, except there's actually eight discourses because the last friend doesn't talk the third time. Mm -hmm. So instead is, of him, do what? Is he is he one that actually sticks with Job? Like kind of he? No, none of the friends no, stuck no, with him. No. In fact, that's one of the things that Job that God says at the end of the book. He's like, you jerks. <laughs> how many how many friends came? Three. Oh, because I, I thought when at the end God said he was he was angry with. Oh, was he says, I, I, uh, your your uh, your the three friends didn't speak oh, correctly. Just two. Oh, okay. So okay, um, and then um, where was I at? Sorry. No, 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 that's good, that's good. Uh, ask as many questions as you want. Um, I just forgot where I was going. Um, we were talking about the three friends. Oh, yes, so then instead of the the third friend having having his third speech, he's cut off with Job's extended speech where he's just going on and on and on. Evidently, this struck a nerve or something because he just had this renewed energy to prove himself right. And then in chapter 32, this guy Elihu starts speaking. And... Just out of nowhere, he's ne he's not mentioned before in the book, mm -hmm. and when he's done talking, he's not mentioned again. Job doesn't answer him. Mm -hmm. God doesn't answer him. His his speech is just like thrown in there, like it does. Like, like it's almost like he started talking. And everybody's like, okay, when are you gonna start shutting up? Well, you know, he was the youngest, right? The youngest yes, one. and he wasn't one of the friends. No. He was just an onlooker. Really? Yeah, like so he just he just, just listened there. to this whole thing happen and right. he's like, Hold up fellas, I gotta say something. I imagine like <laughs> he's like the neighbor guy, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Right? He's, he's like these old dudes sitting out there in the dirt for just this long goal about that. He's like, Okay, I finally I gotta go do something about this. <laughs> right. Oh my gosh, it's so funny. <laughs> but unlike but unlike everybody else everybody else, his speech is never weighed. Mm. I, you you got to wonder why Job didn't answer him. Did yeah. he think it wasn't worth answering him? <laughs> was he just tired of talking to him? <laughs> was, was he that guy that nobody really liked? Like, oh, great, now he's here. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, and, and nobody ever says. In fact, if you removed Elihu from the book of Job, you wouldn't even notice it. Go straight from chapter 31 to chapter uh, 38, and 
there will be no break in the story. Yeah. He's not mentioned before or after, and his speech in no way is groundbreaking for the story of the book. The book could have progressed without him. So the question is, like, is that the point? <laughs> that he's like this young guy that nobody's listening to? Or was there some other reason why Job and God both felt the need to not address what he said at all? Um, okay, so just a few things before we actually get going. Um, the first, Job kept seeking God and God answered. There, I think there's je definitely a lesson there. Because we're going to look at this next week, but God never answered Job's questions. The question, why do the righteous suffer, is never addressed in this book. That's the entire theme of the book, and yet it's never answered. Okay, that's an important point. I'll come back to that next week. Um, next up, uh, it seems like the main point here is that God knows our hearts, and there's kind of almost like a, an uh, encouragement to wrestle with God. You know, it, it, don't don't run from the things that are confusing you with God, but actually, it, you know, pray and, and seek. Some 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 people are are, are afraid of real, being real with God, so they just kind of hide behind a, 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 a false front all the time. And a lot of times, God wants that realness. Like Jacob, for instance, he's in this. He's in, really got himself into a pickle. So what does he do? He wrestles with God, and he's actually blessed for it. Job here, he's in a heck of a pickle. He doesn't know what's going on. He doesn't ever get his answer, but he wrestles with God, and he's blessed for it. It seems like God's not afraid to be wrestled with, but at the same time, we have to be respectful and honoring of him. Right. Like, for instance, in Ecclesiastes, it says, uh -huh. um, you know, remember that God's up here, and you're, you're down here. Remember that. Right. But at the same time, it, God's not insecure, no. and, and, and there's a certain level of, of, of he interacts with us as we seek him. I think that's an important point. Um, so we looked at, before we looked at Job, we looked at Philippians. Um, and Paul, uh, Paul talked a lot about how to deal with it. How to deal with depression, how to, how to deal with anxiety. He, he was really talking about a lot of that. But he didn't really answer too much about why am I having these struggles. So I would summarize Philippians as what you should do. Philippians but, are talking about the book? Or the, the book. Oh, the book. Okay. It was the book that we studied before this one. Um, but then in Job, it's more of how you can help someone else. Completely complete different. And Because remember, in Job, the answer, it, it never really gives an answer. Job finally speaks at the end of the book, just like Job wanted. Or God finally speaks at the end of the book like Job wanted, but never gives an answer. Slightly frustrating. Yeah. <laughs> um, Sometimes it doesn't. Ju sometimes things just don't just go away. You know what I mean. Sometimes you're going to face struggles and they're not going to go away. You're not going to have a clear understanding as to why it's happening, and that's just the way it's going to go. So I think that that's an extremely important before you start, you know, um, judging people and you know, uh, what's it called? Where you, um, you know, where a doctor says that this is what's wrong. What's that called? Diagnosis. Diagnosis. Yes. Before you start diagnosing people of their sin, maybe remember that. Um, also, another thing that's very clear from Job, battles are spiritual. Sometimes people ask, is this, is this spiritual warfare or is this physical? Let me just kind of clarify this. Everything is spiritual warfare. Everything. Let's say you are having a physical illness that has nothing to do with Satan. You are just having a family illness because it runs in your family. God uses it and it becomes a spiritual battle. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like, even if you get something as minor as a cold, it, it's an opportunity to either seek God or not seek God. Because everything with our physical being is inter intertwined with our spiritual being. So, so it becomes a spiritual battle, not because you battle necessarily with Satan all the time. Yes. Because you battle with yourself. Yes. Exactly what I'm saying. Mind, right? Sometimes sometimes Satan is the one one to blame, and there is spiritual things going on, like demonic and stuff. Okay, all right. But not all the time. Sometimes it's something else, and sometimes you're fighting yourself. Sometimes you're fighting people, all these different things. But in all these things, remember, at its core, it is a spiritual battle because you're faced with the opportunity to trust God. You're faced with the opportunity to grow. You're faced with the opportunity to learn. See what I mean? And that makes it a spiritual battle. But it's not something you cast demons out. No, no, no. No, I'm not saying that. I'm not it's saying... It's just for the cold. <laughs> I, I, I'm not saying, like, for instance, you know, Jamie's got cancer. She just needs to rebuke the spirit of cancer. That's not what I'm saying at all. Some Did not say that. Some people do believe that. Yes, I, I know, and I want to clarify. <laughs> I am not saying that. It's ridiculous. But in that, in that physical illness is an opportunity for spiritual growth, and therefore it becomes a spiritual battle. 
Who who took Job's stuff? The Scythians and these tribes over here and these tribes. Satan didn't literally come down and take his camels away. Satan instigated the affair, but it was people who took the camels and people who took the stuff. Right. He uses people. Right. So you see what I'm saying? It, it, we don't know what's going on with, with God or whatever. We do know how we respond to the situation makes it a spiritual battle. So, okay. Um, we also see, I mentioned this last, last week, that Job is a kind of Christ figure. He is a righteous person who didn't do anything wrong and yet is still suffering. In the same way, Jesus, who would come later, literally never sinned. Now, Job was blameless, but he had sinned. Job even says this himself, I, you know, I have sinned. Je Jesus, on the other hand, has ne had never sinned. And so he was truly righteous, truly blameless, and yet he carried the whole weight of all the all the all the world's sin. When I see them, when I see the translations uh, that say blameless, it, it's kind of difficult for me to distinguish between blameless and sinless. Because mm -hmm. to me, when I think of blameless, I think kind of those are kind of the same things. But well, that's why you, that's why we started the discussion with looking at Philippians. And go ahead and say what you're saying, and I'll just how, how, how would how, how would you say what would you say the difference is between so blameless isn't about being sinless. It's about um, living in a way that is above reproach. Like for instance, um, if you can't be accused of anything, like you're... right, right. Like if I'm doing cocaine, you can accuse me of something. I'm I'm doing an illegal substance that's very harmful. But if I'm not doing it, I'm blameless in the area of drugs. See what I'm saying? Yeah. If I'm cheating on my wife, I'm not blameless. If I'm remaining faithful, I am blameless. So it's not about being sinless because no man is sinless. Right. But bl being blameless is, and, and Paul talks about this, you know, when he when in Philippians, which is the book we looked at before this, um, about be blameless. Well, it wasn't the time to be perfect. So, um, does that answer that question? Yes. Okay. All right. So, um, Job, in a way, foreshadows Jesus. He he points toward that there would be a coming Messiah. And we looked at this last week when he mentions the uh, the heavenly fi figure who's not a person who in, who mediates between us and God, and yet is himself God. Well, who is that? Well, Jesus. So, Job, in a large part, points towards the coming Christ without ever even mentioning the Christ, which I think is amazing. Uh, Job isn't just about the sufferings of the righteous, but also, by necessity, it's about the endurance of the wicked. See, Job answers one question, but in answering the, asking that question, it answers the opposite question. The question it asks is, why do the righteous suffer? But in asking that question, it also asks, why do the wicked endure? It's by necessity. Okay. So, any questions on that before we look at Elihu and get into the chapters? We're all good? Okay, just stop me if you guys get anything. So, Elihu is a young, overbearing onlooker. He's in no way related to the to the people. He just has been listening to what's going on. He, he quotes Job pretty closely a couple times. Um, so, he, he was paying attention. He was just kind of sitting back and listening. And the reason why he says this is because he was young. Um, whereas Job and his friends were all wise, I mean, older, and in that culture, not wise. And, and that in that culture, uh, being elderly meant w was synonymous with wisdom. Um, it sometimes is is today, but let me tell you, I've met some sixty-year-old children. I tell you what. Um, okay, uh, but there is this de this definite idea that you know the, the young should keep quiet in the in, in the presence of the elderly. So that's what he's doing. Right. But they've all gotten quiet, and he's like, "Well, hold up, fellas, <laughs> hold up." Um, so we know that he's young because he says that. We know that he's overbearing because he's like, oh, I'm just, I'm just trying to, trying to be fair here and not have any bias. But yet he spends an entire chapter basically saying this. I'm getting ready to say something. He spends an entire chapter not saying anything, but saying that he's going to say something. And then he says multiple times, answer me. But then he doesn't give Job an opportunity to answer because he won't oh. stop talking for long enough for Job to answer. Right. I, I don't know if that had anything to do with Job not answering. Maybe by that, by the time that this guy finally shut up for long enough, he's like, just forget about it. Forget just it. forget it. Um, but okay. Uh, he repeatedly references Job's speeches from throughout the book. Um, I'm not going to draw uh, draw attention to each one of those because we would have to go over everything we've already looked at. We're not going to do that. Um, if you read through it and then read through what Job said, you'll be able to pinpoint it pretty quickly. Um, he's irritated at both parties. Uh -huh. He's irritated because the friends claimed that Job was was evil, but they couldn't say show why what what he did on the, that was so evil. And he's irritated at Job because instead of um, instead of uh, vindicating God. He's been trying to prove his own righteousness, and for whatever reason, that really pissed off a lot of you. I have no idea why, but that's what he says, so whatever. Um, 
Job was sinning and his suffering is basically what Elihu says throughout his speeches. Um, it wasn't that he was suffering because it wasn't that he was suffering because uh, he sinned. That's one of the major points why how he disagrees with the three friends. He doesn't say this has come on you because of your sin. He instead says, in the midst of your suffering, you're sinning because you're trying to prove that God is not righteous or that God is somehow not caring about what's happening with the right. This is wrong. So that's what he focuses on. And then uh, he saw suffering as a way instead of instead of seeing suffering as um, necessarily uh, a punishment for a sin, he sees it as God's way to keep um, to keep people on the right path, right. to keep them from being arrogant, to keep them from being prideful, to keep them from walking in sin. So he has a, a, quite a few differences. Um, and r keep in mind that God does not reprimand Elihu for what he says. Keep that in mind. He he reprimands the three friends, but he doesn't say anything against Laiu. Well, so that he was the guy who I thought supported Job a little bit. Well, he no, he doesn't support uh, Job. He just doesn't support anybody. He says you're all wrong. You're all stupid. Now that now let me this young buck come in here and tell you all how you're wrong. <laughs> Can you just imagine this? Okay, you're this. I don't know. Roll with me here. You're this 60 year old guy. Or let's just say that you're 60, and you're talking with your other 60 year old homeboys, and you're all irritated at each other. Um, you know what? Let's make it even funner. Let's say Mary Potter, okay? And let's multiply her by four. And she's sitting there arguing with herself, and you know how that goes, okay? Now imagine how funny this is, okay? Just just imagine that. Now imagine this young guy, th this Micah, you know, this four-year-old little boy comes in and says, well, you guys are all wrong. <laughs> just imagine how funny yeah. that is. <laughs> that is just so funny. Yep. Um, anyways, um, <clears throat> so... Uh, Sin did get, uh, give Job the opportunity to trust God. That is true. And um, we saw that with Satan at the beginning. So so that that is definitely true. But here's the thing. None of these answer Job. There's a lot of different reasons given throughout the book of Job for right, why someone could hypothetically suffer. But not one of them answers Job. Even when God speaks, he doesn't answer Job. So just a real quick summary of the chapters, uh, chapter 32, 1 through 3. This whole section is Elihu speaking, so that's why I didn't specify who's talking. 32, uh, verse 1, all the way to verse 7 of thirty-three, uh, chapter 33, all that Elihu says is, I'm going to say something. I am. And That's all he says in the whole chapter and seven verses of another chapter. Like, wow, dude, talk about not saying anything. And then he, he goes uh, in verse 8 through 24, um, you're all wrong. Well, thanks for that. Uh, and uh, he never uh, – he was never answered by Job or God. So that's kind of kind of a point there. God's yeah, probably like, what in the world is this guy doing? <laughs> Maybe he thought, you know, this guy's, a, this guy's already embarrassed himself. Let's just kind of – Let's just ignore it. Let's this. downplay it and pretend yeah. it didn't happen. You know when, when somebody does something so, so in, incredibly childish that you're just like – Oh dear God! <laughs> Maybe God was shaking his head like, "Oh yeah. my, why? <laughs> why? So let's let's discuss a few things before we before we look um, more specifically through the chapters. Um, ignore the, the the screaming child in the background. <laughs> that is um, that is my messenger from Satan sent to torment. <laughs> I'm just joking. I'm just joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. Okay, so have you ever heard somebody say something that you just had to give an answer? Let, 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 let's take the, let's make this real. real. Nitty gritty, huh? Um, yeah. Let's see. Um, if you guys want, I can go first if you need some time to think. You go first. You, want, you guys want me to go for it first? Mm -hmm. um, when people say something about uh, not having to live uh, righteous, when they say, oh, I can be called a Christian, but I can live however I want, it just irks me in a way that just, I mean, it pisses me off beyond being pissed off. Like, Oh, it, like, it irritates me so bad, and I just always feel like I have to give an answer. And I've wondered and asked, why do I always feel like I have to give an answer? And I don't know. I just love truth, and I hate it when people just so bend the truth. And all growing up, I was always ignored because, you know, I was the youngest, and nobody ever really had to any, listen to anything I had to say. And now that I'm an adult, I'm like, wait, no, no, you guys are wrong, though. You really have to listen to me. And I really think... <laughs> That I relate to a lot to Elihu. Like, I've been listening to you fools talk, and you're all wrong. You're just wrong. All of you are wrong. <laughs> but you say, yeah. You know, 
I think you and I, in particular, we share a, a, like a hatred for legalism and stuff. Yeah. And you know, I think, I think that, that argument that people give, you know, we can just live however we want or whatever. That's that's the reason why there's a lot of like you know those holiness preachers that you know yeah. that, that are very legalistic and stuff. But yeah. They, they um they preach like that because of the that whole idea. Yeah. It's kind of like a tug of war between the two yeah, groups. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. My stepdad listens to a lot of those preachers. And stuff. Oh yeah. Yeah. So. So you know. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. I know. I know. I know both ends of the spectrum. Yeah. Me too. Very, very much so. Me too. Yeah. But um, I think last time I felt like I had to say something that I, I didn't was I think there's some. Some guy, some people I didn't even know they were arguing about like getting married or something. Uh huh. I, I felt like I had to <laughs> put my two cents in, but I didn't want to say anything. Oh my gosh, that's me. <laughs> I didn't want to be a hater. Or I mean, not, not that I'm for gamers. Right, I know what you're saying. Yeah. Like, it, it's, it, it, it's hard It's hard to know where the line is between saying what is true and then, but at the same time, not... Saying it in a hurtful way. Right, right. And like, does this need to be said right now? Is this something that... You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, at one point, it's like, well, what's the point of arguing with a non-believer that this is wrong because they're not a believer. Like the main point is that they don't know Jesus. So what does it matter if they're they're for or against gay marriage right. if they don't even know Jesus? Yeah. But then on the other side, it's like, but you're wrong. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes, sometimes I think God just tells us like, you know, you, you need to not uh, put your two cents in. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, you gotta wonder if God is ever up there like, oh, no, just. Shh. <laughs> like like at the at the awards and stuff when they say I like to thank Jesus if Jesus is like nope leave me out of this. <laughs> no, because no, I, I feel like sometimes I, I get like a, a arrogance vibe like oh I you know it's it's um like I just thank Jesus like they just say that for yeah almost like for attention yeah exactly <laughs> it's, it's complicated. Meanwhile their lyrics are all full of profanity. I know uh, exactly. yeah. degrading women. <laughs> right. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. It's fine. It's fine. Yeah, <laughs> oh my gosh. So, um, anybody else want to want to give an answer? To this? Have you ever heard somebody say something you just had? It just irked you. You had to give an answer. Nicole. Uh, I actually got into an argument with somebody on Twitter <laughs> about oh mm, a couple weeks ago. Uh huh. They were talking about somebody had a hairstyle that offended them. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> wait, 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 wait. A hairstyle that offended them? They had like braids, uh -huh. like cornrows. Okay. And they were so offended because what? it was, like, racially inappropriate. Oh, like, this was, like, an intense argument. I'm like... I don't understand. That was the point. Oh, okay. Like, okay. People, like, this... Like, four or five people were offended. And I'm like, what's... It's it's hair. Huh. It's... It's like the... T it's, it's a hairstyle. It's the Calm down. It's like a snowflake. A typical, typical snowflake. Right. It, it's just... It's hair, <laughs> and it turned into. And she's like, right, because it happened to my niece. I'm like, so I had to get in, and I said, I mean, I'm I don't know I if don't she talks about involved. the same conversation, but I got I was getting it too, and I'm looking, and I'm like, are you guys kidding me? It's just a hair braid. It's like so I texted back. I said, Emma, just ignore the whole thing. Apparently, people don't know how to joke. I'm like. <laughs> I don't understand what's so offensive about it. And I'm serious. Yeah, they were like so rude. Socially correct. Right. So, so it, was this a celebrity who got this? Yeah. Part? And it turned into such a big argument over a couple of hours just by the one comment I made. And I what did you up, say? I was like, I don't understand why you guys are finding this so offensive. And they're like, well, because you're white, you don't get it. Oh, and as soon as that oh, comment came up, I'm like, oh, alright, I'm done. I'm, I have to back out. Like, okay. We argued about this for like two and a half hours. Okay, now, now get this. I, I, if you know me, you know I'm not racist at all. Yeah. I, yeah. I grew up in Southern California. Like, the, there were no racial boundaries where I grew up. Like, I was oblivious that racism was even a thing until I moved out to New Mexico. I was like, whoa, yeah. people are racist. And then I went to Missouri and I was like, holy crap, there's yeah. a lot of really racist people out there. Yeah. Out there. Yeah. <laughs> You've seen racism here? Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. oh, buddy. I've actually yeah, never really seen like real racism until I moved here. So, 
because I've never. Seen. Oh, Pennsylvania is terrible. Yeah, yeah up, up, up north. But okay, so there. so I'm completely oblivious to this, and then I got called on uh, either the beginning of this, this year or, or maybe it was midway through last year. I was called racist, and it's my fault that there are uh, laws um, against uh, against um, you know basically for inequality. For, for racial racially inappropriate laws, it's my fault and my ancestors' fault. And uh, uh, slavery is my fault too. And I was like, okay, let me stop you right there. My ancestors didn't even come over into America until after World War One. Like what? And then they don't even know you. So. Right. And, and like what? What? And then and then my ancestors. They're, they were from Germany, but they weren't Nazis because they came over before World War II. They came in over between World War One and World War II. Like, how am I responsible for America's jacked up rules or, or whatever? Like, what? Yeah, exactly. What? <laughs> what made it even worse is in, it was an international argument. Too. Oh. So it wasn't just, like, United States. You know, I'm like, so tired was... of people just saying, you're racist, just for yeah. no reason. Or it's like, sexist or whatever else. Why yeah, am I but, racist? Yeah. Like, I didn't do anything. Exactly. <laughs> and there was, oh it, it was like four of us like, just like, I'm stepping out of this. Why am I calm down after like a week? So what What was it that, that, that made you feel like you had to give an answer, that, that irked you that you had to give an answer? What like, started it? For the you. The fact that somebody was just so upset over a hairstyle. The, just the like, absurdity just, of it. Just, just like how stupid it was. It's like. It's just ridiculous. So the because fact the that it was stupid. The that it was about was like it was affecting him personally. Uh huh. And just seeing how upset, like the whole entire group was getting affected. So. Like he was a member. He's a member of a singing group. Like the whole entire group was starting to get affected over like all the hate comments. So it was that the part that got you that that yeah. somebody was being basically like picked all on. The hate. That was going around the other side. Okay. I was just, just like, okay. You just wanted to grab those people across the screen and shake them in the <laughs> Wake up, people. Come on. So anybody else ha- have, a, have a situation where they just they just check? Oh, I've many, many. Of them. Is there one you want to share? There's one. Um, somebody, and again, this was on social media. Of course. Why I'm not on social <laughs> media anymore. Um, they, they posted something about people need to stop talking about them on social media, okay? Okay. And then, like, two or three days later, they start bad-mouthing their parents that they didn't even have a relationship with anymore on social media. So I went out there, and I was like, um, you might want to, you know, check yourself because... You, just, you don't like people talking about you, but here you are talking about your parents, and you don't even have to do with your parents. Oh my gosh. And what was it about it that, that made you feel like you had to give an answer? Just the hypocrisy. Yeah. See, if you. And they're one of those that always call people hypocrites and, and everything, you know. And, are, you, are you guys noticing a theme in all yes. this? Chuck felt like he had, he had to answer because somebody was being a hypocrite. Nicole felt like she had to answer because she felt like someone. Was just being mean, mm-hmm. just just being mean. Right. I felt like I had to answer because I felt like people were just like being stupid. So I mean, all of these things. It's like that's kind of my point with Elihu. He's sitting here trying to be respectful and, and trying, but he he hears something that's bothering him. Mm-hmm. He thinks that people are dishonoring God, and he can't stand it. See, it, it, it's easy for us to just throw away Elihu's speech because he's young and arrogant. And he goes on and on and on. I mean, this guy just never shuts up. But at the same time, when you put yourself in that, in that, see what I mean? It's a lot easier to see, oh, yeah. And that's really what's going on here. And we already looked at that. So, okay, so chapter 32 of Job. I am of them. There are some people who think that this whole section here was just invented after the book was already written. I don't think that that's the point. I think it completely overlooks the whole story. Because if I was going to add a character that didn't belong into a story, I would have worked him in. 
Right. Made him where you couldn't take him out, so you couldn't tell that I inserted him in. Exactly. The fact that he comes in so abruptly and ends just as abruptly, I think that's the whole point. So I'm going to go under the assumption that the book of Job was written exactly how jo how God meant it for it to be. Right. And that the, th the characters are actually factual, um, even if they didn't necessarily say the things exactly how it's written. I I will allow for editing, but I, I fully believe that this is this is historical. So I we're gonna look at that moving forward. Um, in verse nine, he says, "It is not only the old who are wise, not only the aged who understand what is right." And he's right. It isn't just age. I mean, you have Job's three friends; all of them were wrong, and God says so. Yeah. So he is there. There are definitely things, and here's the thing: like Job's friends. When they're talking, not everything that they say is wrong. It just didn't necessarily apply to the situation. Right. And verse 13, it says, Do not say we have found wisdom. Let God, not a man, refute him. So basically what they're saying is, you know what? We've had enough of this hooligan. And I know that we're right. So let God show him that he's wrong. Uh. See what I mean? That's basically what they're saying. And so Elihu is like, no, don't do that. Don't back off. you got to keep, keep arguing with this guy. Which... I mean, obviously, I'm not necessarily agreeing. I'm not agreeing with what he's saying there. Um, so we know what's up, and that's good enough for us. <laughs> and then in verse 14, uh, but Job has not marshaled his words against me, and I will not answer him with your arguments. So basically, I come as an outsider. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna talk to him. You guys have been talking to him, and he's, he's, he has nothing against me because I, I'm an outsider here. So this will all go good. But Job just doesn't answer at all. And uh, I think it's funny because. You know, Elihu does try to be diplomatic, and he tries to be fair. He really does try, I think. Yeah. But his mind was already made up at the beginning. He said, it's, it, it starts out chapter thir chapter 32 saying, but Elihu was pissed off. <laughs> like, it doesn't say that word, those words like that. But he's already mad. He's already made up his mind that Job is, and he's already made up his mind that everybody's wrong. It's impossible to be fair if you already think that everybody's wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Just throwing that out there. Um, and, you know, he does try to be diplomatic, but then he says these little jabbing comments. Like, if you're trying to meet somebody in the middle, maybe say, lay off the, the meanness and the sarcasm. Just throwing that out there. Uh, so then chapter 33, um, verses 8 through 9. And a lot of this stuff, uh, you just read through it and you'll kind of get the flow of it. But to go verse by verse would honestly be a waste of your time. Um in, 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 in the class. It's not a waste of your time to read it verse by verse, but for the discussion. But you have said in my hearing, I heard the very words, I am pure, I have done no wrong, I am clean and free from sin. Now, Job did say this, but it's slightly out of context. It makes it sound like he's trying to say that he was he, he had never sinned. And Job had not said that. In fact, we even looked at this earlier where Job specifically said that he was a sinner. He acknowledged that at least twice in the chapters before. So clearly... Elihu was taken out of context. Um, Job admitted he was a sinner, but said he was blameless in the situation. That's That was Job's point, that, that, that he didn't do anything wrong so as to be punished. That was Job's contention. Uh, so This helps me to understand the difference between blameless and... So oh, it does? Yeah. Oh, good. What we're reading right now. Oh, okay, good. Yeah, if you read, if you read through Job's discussion, he, 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 he highlights it, especially in, uh, in chapter 31. Uh, he goes all through these different things. Um... In like verse 5, for instance, if I have walked with falsehood or my foot has hurried after deceit, so he wasn't being dishonest. Um, if my heart has been enticed by a woman, if, if I've been lusting after someone else. So he talks about all these different things about how he hasn't been doing that. So anyways, uh, so then um, in verse uh, 12 of chapter 33, he says, But I tell you, in this you are not right, for God is greater than any mortal. So once again, we have Elihu... He's right in a way. You cannot understand God. And, and actually, that's kind of a big point. And God himself is going to talk about this in just in, in, when he starts talking in chapter 38. That you can't understand God's ways. And so Elihu was on the right track, mm -hmm. largely. He said some things that weren't right and some things that didn't really apply. But largely, he was, he was at least headed for, this, for the right answer, right. that we can't understand God's ways. So, okay, all right, all right. But that answer isn't sufficient. Like, it's, it's on the right path, but it doesn't, it doesn't actually answer the full, the full problem. Um, in verse 14, for God does speak. So you, you're saying that you want to hear from God, but God does speak. 
now one way, now another. So so basically what he's saying is God does speak in, in, in various ways, though no one perceives it. And then he starts mentioning a, a, a couple different ways, in a dream, in a vision of the night. Um, so God speaks just in other ways that you're wanting. So he, he, what he's talking about here is, Job, you're not listening, but God is talking. So in, in a way, that's true. Um, in the ancient Near East, it was very popular for um, for vision uh, for dreams to have special meaning. Um, some people now kind of push that, you know, they'll eat cheese pizza and then they'll go to sleep and dream about a spider that eats, you know, the Empire State Building. And they'll be like, it's a sign, and it's like, okay, whatever. Uh, <laughs> but in the ancient Near East, it was very common for that. Um, and and Job d did say that he was having uh, having dreams that that scared him. Um, so there is that. Uh, and you gotta wonder, was jo was God trying to speak to him? Well, it really wasn't. It really wasn't said. We know that God does speak to him later on, very clearly, but um, we don't know if God tried to speak to him before that. Um, Job uh, thirty-four, verse four. Any questions on any of this? Uh, I, we're just kind of skimming through this part pretty quickly. No. No. Okay. Uh, verse four. Let us discern for ourselves what is right. Let us learn together what is good. This is the ancient version of follow your own error. <laughs> um, they, could, they could not stumble upon wisdom just from thinking hard enough. And that's the same thing that applies now. It's not like we have to go onto a mountain and just search within ourselves for long enough and we'll come up with the answer. No. No. No, no, no. No. It's no. kind of like the cliche no. thing that is so popular these days. It's uh, sort of like follow your heart or something. Yeah. Just do like whatever so seems popular. best to you. It, yeah. Like in movies, you know, they always say, like, yeah. Like, yeah. It's, yeah. It's crazy. yeah. Chuck and I have had long, angry discussions about this. <laughs> not, not, we don't disagree. We don't disagree with each no, other. But a, them all. Right. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, verse 11. Uh, it says. He repays everyone for what they have done. He brings on them what their conduct deserves. So people receive their just punishment. Now, this is true, but sometimes it doesn't happen how we want it to. And sometimes people suffer without cause. And see what I mean? Sometimes Elihu is a little bit too black and white. And sometimes he, st he still says, hey, you know, if you do what's right and stuff, then, you know, nothing bad will ever happen to you. And it's like, well, no, Elihu, no. Uh, that's just not not that's that's not as accurate. I bet Joe was like, oh my gosh. I'm hearing this again. I, I could have sworn. Now some people think that Elihu said the same thing as the three friends, but I hope that I'm showing you how he really has varied in his discussion. Um, so okay, verse 13 says, "Who appointed him over the earth? God, him, him being God. Who put uh, him in charge of the whole world?" So here he has another very good point. God is not subject to a law of fairness. Some people think that it's that it goes something like this. Okay, here is this law of fairness. It's just it's just inherent inherent in the world. Okay, it exists and everybody's held to it. Even God is subject to this law of fairness. He has to do things that you know is congruent with this law of fairness, and that's just not the case. There is only the idea of good and fairness because of God. Justice is an emanation of God's character. Does that make sense? God is good, and he's the standard of what is good and not good. Right. So God is not held to this, you know, somehow law that just exists inherently in the universe. He is the law of what is good and what is just. And that's another thing that Elihu gets right. Mm -hmm. is he's, he's saying you guys are, are, are acting like God has somehow should be held accountable for how he acted like maybe he's been unjust. But no, no, God is he is just, and if you look at the speech, what, what Elihu is saying, that's what he's saying. So once again, another thing that, that Elihu is right on. Um, God, in verse 23, and still in chapter 34, um, God has no need to examine people further that they should come before him for judgment. Now remember, Job said earlier, if only I could go and appear to him like a court case kind of deal and, and prove my innocence. Right. And Elihu is saying he doesn't have to double-check his findings. If he finds someone guilty, he knows that they're guilty. He knows people's hearts. Like, you're not really thinking this one through here, guys. And he, once again, he is right there, too. God judges correctly in all things. And so he knows what is true and what is not true. And he can see the hearts and the depths of man. So God doesn't have to reanalyze his judgment. However, he is wrong in assuming that Job is wrong. So... Uh, 
Because either he doesn't see Job's uh, the depths of Job's heart and stuff. What are you saying? He doesn't see the depths of Job. He doesn't see Job's heart. Are you talking about Elihu? Yeah. Oh yeah. I I think yeah I think Elihu's not taking in consideration that Job is going through a lot of grief and like young and people do. Right. Like young people do. Right. Exactly. When when you're young, let me let me ask you guys something. I'm sorry. You guys keep. So, oh, okay. All right, good. I, I, I kind of cut you off. Sorry about that. Um, let me ask you guys this. I don't know how you guys feel now. I know you're you're in your 30s. You know, um, you're just in your early 20s. I mean, you're just getting there, young buck. No, I'm, I'm just joking. I'm just joking. Hey, we're, 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 we're <laughs> I, I'm totally joking. I'm totally joking. But when you're young, and, and vouch me with me on this, when you're young, death seems so distant, and it feels like you're going to live forever and nothing's ever going to change. Yes. Right? Yes. I don't feel that way, actually, to be honest. Well, I mean, not that... Not but that when I, you were a kid, you did, right? Yeah. Kind of? Yeah, sort of. Sort of. I mean, I've, I've always been terrified by death since I was a kid, and I I, I always realized that things were going to change and death and stuff. I was always afraid of that. But roll with me here. Pretend like you... I'm rolling with you. <laughs> I'm just joking. I'm just joking. But mo- most young people... Uh, do you like that one better? Most yes. young people? Okay. Most young people... <laughs> Uh, you know, they kind of have this idea that nothing's going to change, everything's just going to... And then you start tasting death, like when you're yes. cold stage, for instance, and yes. people start dying, and yeah. you start realizing that things aren't as right. solid as you thought that they were. Right. You know, and I, I think Gracie's really onto something. I think Elihu was still at that point of youth and, and, and youngness where he thought, you know, da 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 I can conquer all, all you have to do is just power through. And Job's on the other side of that hill where right. he's like, you know, uh, I'm old now and man. there's no powering through this. I'm going to die in this and people are going to think that I was in the wrong when I'm not. Right. And uh, you, I, I think you're right on, Grace. I think there's definitely that spectrum going on. That Job is, is, is older. Have you, ever, have you ever met an old person who had something that they really, really wanted to happen, their dreams just completely dashed? They just go to pieces, right? Mm-hmm. And that's all that they ever talk about is that thing that they wanted to happen never happened. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I wanted my kids to be in ministry, and I never got to see it. Um, I, you know, I just wanted this to happen, and I never got to see it. You know, and it's just, uh, that's that thing for them. And, and you see Job in that place. Yeah. He just wanted to be proven right. I didn't do these things that everybody's accusing me of. I just want to be proven that I'm a basically, I, I'm a good guy. I didn't do yeah. anything wrong. You're all accusing me wrong. Right. He just wanted to be proven right. And Elijah, on the other, other hand, his whole life's ahead of him. Yeah. You know, he's got his whole young, arrogant thing going on. He's like, man, so your kids died. Pull yourself together, man. Seriously. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So and so yeah. said another thing. Yeah, I know. Because oh, remember, remember, all of his friends have told him, your kids died because you sinned. Or the other guy, your kids died because they sinned. You better turn from your sin before you die, too. <laughs> you know, and his kids just died. I've lost a kid before. It's hard. Job lost a bunch of kids at the same time. That's hard, man. And none of his friends cared. Uh-uh. Like, dang, guys, dang. Even if he was a sinner, just, I mean, encourage the guy a little yeah, bit. Just a little. <laughs> so anyways, I, um, I think Grace is spot on with that. So I uh, already looked at that. God sees what is right and what is not. He doesn't have to go to court. Absolutely. So chapter 35. He's the judge. Right. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> Set me free. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, verse uh, 8. Uh, your wickedness only affects humans like yourself, and your righteousness only other people. Now, once again, Elihu is right. When you are righteous, God doesn't it, – it doesn't validate God as a person. He's, he's God no matter what you do. Right. Your righteousness is not going to somehow make him more God. Likewise, if you choose to be a wicked person, it's gonna, not going to make God any less of God. He's always going to be God. He is not dependent on your actions. So Elihu is once again correct when he says, your wickedness only affects humans like yourself, and your righteousness only other people. You are affecting other people, not God. You're not changing who he is. So once again, Elihu is really in the right direction. God has nothing to gain or lose from us. If if Job wasn't righteous, it wouldn't make God more, I mean, less righteous. Does that make sense? Right. So here we go. Again, Elihu is really just, he's so close to getting it. He's just so close to getting it. And I think that's why Job did, and God didn't reprimand him. Because I think that he was really on the right path. Maybe he fell a little bit short of that 
understanding, but you know, eh, it'll, it's fine. He probably figured it out later. <laughs> he's, he's right. He's right, but in the wrong context. Yeah. Yes. And you know what the thing is that that makes him better than the three friends is his attitude's different. Yes. His attitude's different. So that that's very important. And in fact, we're gonna look at this next week. But they were trying to, um, trying to trying to sweet talk God. Yeah. You know, they gave these long discourses about you know God and everything, trying to get get him on their side and basically being hypocrites. Right. And Job, on the other hand, isn't talking with all this great, you know, uh, great rhetoric. You know, he goes between doubting God one verse to just a few verses later saying, I will trust him until death. And then the next one being, I'll die without seeing God, him answer me. So, you know, you, you see Job in this pit of depression going back and forth between highs and lows. He's not even saying things right, and yet God vindicated him, even though he did say some wrong things. Right. But God still vindicated him. I think that's really important. So verses 10 through 11 and still in chapter 35. Still. <laughs> it says, But no one says, Where is God my maker who gives songs in the night? Who teaches us more than he teaches? Uh, who teaches us more than he teaches the beasts of the earth and makes us wiser than the birds in the sky? So basically what he's saying here is God gives joy and wisdom. It's, it's not, you know, you, you people who only recognize the hard times, you're being super arrogant. Because God also gives the good times, and he also gives wisdom. Once again, being a sign of Elihu's youth, that he would say something so insensitive. <laughs> yeah. So yes, he is right in this, but maybe he shouldn't have said it no. right at this time. <laughs> uh, anyways, um, which another good point that from, from what Elihu was saying is don't become overly focused on the bad. Now, that that is true, well, but yeah. Job should wait patiently in righteousness and contentment for God. Well, hypothetically, yeah... I, I, you know, but remember that he just lost his kids, you know, here and everything that he owns and his health. Maybe you could, you know, be a little bit understanding of that. Yeah. yeah. So, does God have to answer for people to trust? And I don't want necessarily discussion on this. I want you to think about this. Does God have to give an answer in order for people to trust him? No. Just, just, no, 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 just think about it. Just think about it. What if you're going through something that you just cannot explain? It is exactly the opposite of what you've been praying. It seems like God couldn't possibly get glory from this. You're in the middle of it. God's not answering it. Does God have to explain to you why this is happening for you to trust him? Or are you going to choose to trust him in the heart of it? And that, I believe, is where we cross the bridge between trusting God in word and trusting God with our heart. Mm -hmm. It's like worshiping yeah. God. Anybody can sing a, sing a song to God. That's the easiest song, thing in, in the world to do. In fact, it gets even easier with a lot of the modern songs because you can't tell they're singing to a girlfriend or to God. I'm just joking. I'm joking. Oh. Anyways, uh, but with that being said, um, th 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 that's easy. But what's hard is when you're in the middle of a struggle to then still live for God, even though everybody's making fun of you, even though it doesn't make sense, even though science seems to disprove God, even though that even everybody's making fun of you, everybody thinks that that's just a religion of yesteryear. And then you're going through a dark time in your life. You're struggling with maybe depression or whatever, and you still worship God. That's what takes us from the line between singing a song and worshiping God. With our hearts. Really. Yes. And I think that's one of the things that Job learned from this whole thing. Is He, yeah. he crossed the, path, the, the bridge between he always served God and honored God, but, but this really gave him the opportunity to trust God. And I think Satan was right in that. Yeah. You're blessing him, but if you just if you just show him some bad times, then you'll then he'll see. I think Satan was yes. onto something there yeah. because a lot of people only want to serve God so long as it profits them. Right. And basically, what Satan is saying is, how do you know that he trusts you, God? You haven't ever given him an opportunity to not trust you. No. Which is a valid argument. Yeah. That is a valid argument, and so I evidently God agreed that it was a valid argument too because He went along with it. Right? <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So I think that I think that's one of the big things here is that He was crossing the line between theoretical and actual. For Elihu, suffering was to teach. It, it teaches us things. It warns us. It's a punishment, and it brings us to repentance. And, and, and so God kind of withholds and, and waits just for us to for us to repent. Maybe during this time of suffering, this will be this will open your eyes. And another thing is, he says is, when someone is on their is sick and 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 bed and bedridden, it, it helps them to uh, to 
to hear to hear what God's trying to tell them, and He's right. Mm -hmm. In fact, I was reading a commentary today that talked about that, and it, it talked about uh, C.S. Lewis's book. Um, what was it called? Uh, Screeching Letters. No, something with suffering. I think it's just called the problem with suffering, the or something like. That. Suffering. Is that what it's called? Yeah. Okay, we referenced C.S. Lewis, Lewis's book about the problem with suffering and how sickness is really a megaphone that God uses to talk to us and. It helps us to listen, too. Um, so anyways, chapter 36, and we're getting towards the end of this. Um, verse 4, it says, Be assured that my words are not false. One who has perfect knowledge is with you. Elihu be, said that? Elihu says that. <laughs> so be careful of being able to fix everyone's problems. Be careful when you know what everybody else is doing wrong, how they can fix all their problems, and that you are the fixer to everything. Just be careful of that. Uh, verses 6 to 7. Um, he does not keep the wicked alive, but keep, gives the afflicted their rights. He does not take his eyes off the righteous. He enthrones them, enthrones them with kings and exalts them forever. I, I, once again, a little one-sided, mm -hmm. like Job's friends were. Even if his attitude and perspective is different, he still says something here that's a little bit similar. Everything's going to go good for you if you do this. And it's like, well, no. Mm -hmm. um, verse 21, uh, same chapter. Beware of turning to evil, which you seem to prefer to affliction. Now, once again, he could have left off that last part, which yeah. you seem to prefer to affliction. Remember what he's just gone through, buddy. Maybe back off a little bit. Like That's right. one of those cutting remarks I was telling you about. Yeah. But the first part of it, he does have a, have a good point. In your frustration, do not turn from what is right. That, that, that is a good point. You know, Don't get so disheartened. Paul says it like this, um, that in the proper time you will reap a harvest if you don't give up. I think like Galatians or something. Yes, like Galatians. That's yeah. exactly what it's from, yeah. Sorry, my finger keeps twitching, Diane. I didn't mean to do that. Um, verse 23, then. Uh, Who has prescribed his ways for him, or said to him, you have done wrong? So once again, come, uh, throughout this last section here, which just really finishes up... Um, um, which it's actually in twenty. Sorry, it's actually in thirty-seven. That's on. I forgot. I when I was typing it, I accidentally left it on this chapter. So pretend that twenty-three is on there, which it is. Oh, I but just pretend like that last twenty-three wasn't there. Uh, and he, this is how he finishes up his his his. You know, two, three, four, five, six, seven. His six chapter long uh, tangent uh, <laughs> is he ends on actually a very good note. Uh, he says here in verse 23, um, The Almighty is beyond our region, exalted in power. In his justice and, gr and great righteousness, he does not oppress. Therefore, people revere him. For he does not have regard for all... For does he not have regard for all the wise in, in heart? Once again, we have a very important thing. Come with praise and awe, not arrogance. Don't come to God saying, I'm wise, I have all the answers. And this is actually something that God's going to kind of talk about a little bit too. So, I mean, I really think that he was very close to having the right answer here. We cannot understand, but we can trust. So what, what's Elihu, how does Elihu finish his thing? Come with awe when you come to God. Instead of trying to have the answers, instead of you know demanding God the answers, come with awe. And, I, and once again, I really think that he's on the right thing here. Elihu's real complaint in all this, okay, the heart of Elihu's complaint was that God was being condemned. By Job and by the friends' silence. He saw the friends not addressing Job as them conceding that Job, I mean, that, that God was, was, was wrong. He, he, see, at the heart of it, that was his main complaint, is that God was being condemned. He just wanted to prove that God was righteous. He had the right heart. Right. He may have been arrogant, may have been young, and not quite understood all the intricacies of it. He didn't really have a full answer. In fact, that's one of the things that kind of surprises me. He starts off his speech saying, oh, I, you know, let me give you an answer. But then he never really gives an answer. He starts to, but then he just kind of backs off. He's so, kind of too brave at first. Though. Yeah, kind of like yeah. maybe he started talking before he thought it all the way through. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. well, I better go ahead and finish this up here, guys, because I don't know what else to say. So any questions on that? <laughs> ne next week. Excuse me. Next week we're going to look at God's um, God's discussion, and then uh, Job's very brief response, and then the end of the book. So uh, I have a question. Go ahead. It's, it's sort of about the end of the Job. Okay. And uh, Job says at the end he, that he uh, rep repents and does and in dust and ashes or something. Uh huh. But what would he possibly need to repent of? Being that we will look at that next week. Sorry. That is actually part of the thing. We will look at that next week. I will make sure to. In fact, I'm writing myself a note. 
what to repent of. That was actually something I want to make sure. I'll double check, but I believe I got it in the lesson. But I'll double check. Because that, that's always been a, I've always kind of questioned that one. Like, yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So